constant media coverage of Islamic-related terrorism since 9-11 and ensuing conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria have contributed to Americans' continuing suspicion of immigrants from the Middle East. Many have also expressed concern about the links between Islam and forms of government and law Americans find distasteful. In a recent poll conducted April 2017, 41% of Americans agreed that Islam encourages violence more than other faiths. 44% believed there is a natural conflict between Islam and democracy. I believe that history provides a crucial perspective on today's greatest social concerns. I also believe that knowing our past can properly orient us towards the future. Over the course of my research, I came to realize that today's anti-Islamicism fits strikingly well into a pattern of anti-immigrant sentiment in the US, which we call nativism. The history of American immigrant relations warrants at least a few predictions about the future of Islam in this country. Nativism is the idea that a certain group of people can be identified as native to, or the rightful heirs of, a geopolitical territory and that consequently, natives possess the privilege of deciding who belongs and who counts as an outsider based on their supposed foreign connections. The case could be made that nativism in this sense is universal. People like to feel at home. We like to surround ourselves with others who share our language, customs, beliefs, and or race. It must be noted that nativism does not necessarily entail racism, although Increases in racist acts are often linked to rises in political nativism. Political nativism describes the use of this belief in inheritance to justify policies favoring natives first to the detriment of outsiders. Historically, the social fear of immigrants has not demonstrated a clear beginning and end as much as it has surged periodically in waves. Before they targeted Asians, and Latinos, communists, and Muslims. Native-born Americans worried about the undue influence of German and Irish immigrants, and particularly the Catholics in their midst. We have not encountered immigration pressures as intense and pervasive as they were in the 1840s, when first-generation immigrants accounted for up to 14.5% of the total population. Muslims compose about 1% of the total US population now. By comparison, at the time of the Civil War, Catholics constituted up to 10.8% of the total free population. Immigration accounted for most of their growth. The early US, thus, became a testing ground for what happens when a democratic nation committed to universal democratic principles encounters an unexpected host of immigrants with unpopular beliefs. Americans based many of their anti-Catholic opinions on the assumption that while Protestant forms of Christianity worked in perfect harmony with the US Constitution, Catholicism did not. Americans often considered Roman Catholicism backwards and violent. We often forget just how tumultuous Catholic Europe was in the 1840s. A series of internal wars pitted democratic revolutionaries against Catholic monarchies and yielded Catholic extremist killings in places like Italy. As Americans read about Catholic extremism in Europe, they also grew alarmed at increasing immigrant-related violence in American cities, including numerous and bloody Election Day riots between nativists and German and Irish Catholics. The biggest domestic concern besides urban violence was that in a democracy, immigrants eventually gain rights, like the right to vote. The fear was that bishops and priests planned to use their authority to compel all Catholics to vote in unison and thus swing American elections. One nativist put it this way in 1835, the papal is not like the Christian religion, it is a political organization. Papal here uh, was a reference to the Pope or leader of the Roman Catholic Church. 
In a 4th of July speech, 1855, one Reverend Charles Boynton claimed that the following constituted the one central principle of the papacy, that it is her solemn duty to exterminate utterly every faith but her own. It's not that all Catholics were bad, Americans recognized. Samuel Morse, inventor of the telegraph, uh, Morse code, is named in his honor asserted rather in one of his anti-Catholic books, the conspirators are in the foreign importations. Innocent and guilty are brought over together. We must of necessity suspect them all. As I tracked the nativist movement through time, I discovered a democratic process at work that has profoundly shaped our political culture especially once nativists announced their political aspirations in the 1850s. Others accused them of religious bigotry. So, nativists stressed their total commitment to church-state separation. They simply wanted the Roman Catholic Church to stay out of American state affairs. But Catholic Americans argued that Protestant Christians were the ones who possessed preferential treatment. Finally, Americans bit the bullet and acknowledged by the force of their own logic that if Catholics could indeed prove committed to the separation of church and state, then the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution entitled them the right to express their religious beliefs in public just as much and as often as other Christian denominations. So, America's first immigration crisis determined that if any new religious group wants preferential treatment in this country, they aren't going to get it. But if they want equal access to political and public space, well, that's obtainable. And this process hasn't stopped since. The supposed civil religion of the United States, or the fabric of accepted religion in America's political and public spaces, has proven to be an ever-expanding domain. By World War II, most Americans included Judaism, as well as Catholicism, among America's accepted religions. President Dwight Eisenhower perfectly captured this new expanded attitude towards religion in a 1952 campaign speech where he famously declared, our government makes no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. Eight years later, Americans elected John Kennedy as the first Catholic president of the United States. 24% of Americans identify as Catholic today. They split right down the middle during national elections, and I can't think of a single political or public space from which they are excluded. Muslim immigrants arrived in greater numbers after 1965, when Congress overturned an immigration quota system favoring immigrants of European national origins. The crisis in the Middle East, moreover, has created millions of Muslim refugees. In 2016, the U.S. admitted the highest number of Muslim refugees to date. The growth of the Muslim population in the United States, combined with steady media coverage of Islamic-related violence around the world, has given rise to a new American nativist movement which culminated in the elections of 2016. What's interesting is that while the target of fear has changed, the American style of discourse against targeted groups has not. The church-state doctrine serves as the linchpin. Islam, like Catholicism, is a faith, not a race, nationality, or terrorist organization. Let's consider for a moment some recent efforts in the US to ban the construction of Muslim mosques and to pass state legislation against Sharia law. 
In its official 2010 statement against the construction of an Islamic cultural center in Lower Manhattan, the group 9-11 Families for a Safe and Strong America targeted the belief system of Islam thus. Imam Rauf embraces Sharia, a socio-political system of jurisprudence based upon the Quran, which supersedes man-made law and which rejects the constitutional doctrine of the separation of church and state. Replace Imam with priest, Sharia with Roman Catholic dogma, and Quran with Pope in this sentence. And the parallels between anti-Islamicism and anti-Catholicism become obvious. There is hardly a difference in the charges currently being levied against Islam today versus Roman Catholicism in the past. Congresses in all but 16 states have seriously considered legislation to ban Sharia law. By 2014, seven states had actually passed state legislation which either explicitly denounced Sharia law by name or built in some thinly veiled reference to it. Notice the justification issued by one Tennessee representative who declared that Sharia, the Islamic code that guides Muslim beliefs and actions, is not just an expression of faith, but a political and legal system that seeks world domination. It's not clear how long these anti-Sharia bills will last. A court recently ruled one such ban in Oklahoma unconstitutional. As the opening polls showed, many Americans still claim in 2017 that Islam is prone to violence and uniquely incompatible with core American values related to individual rights, women's rights, and religious freedom. At root, there appears to be a growing concern that American homes will look dramatically different unless immediate immigration reform occurs. The act of raising these ideas does not disqualify one from the conversation. The historical record has shown, however, that such claims are unlikely to pass muster for long. The more Americans become acquainted with Muslims, the more likely they will be to see Islamic extremism as aberrant and not representative of Islam as a whole. And each time Muslim Americans encounter anti-Islamicists in the US, they will become more invested in securing their rights under the First Amendment. Precisely because the First Amendment constitutes a vital component of American democracy, these predictions seem warranted. It is not likely the US will follow the direction of France, for example, home to the largest population of Muslims in Europe, about five million. The founding documents of both countries established the separation of church and state, but the French principle of laïcité in Article One has embedded the strong sentiment in France that the church-state doctrine protects the state from religion, whereas the American system has yielded a greater historical emphasis on church-state separation as a fundamental protection of religion. Muslims in France have accordingly found it much more difficult to express their religious beliefs in public. In 2004, France became the first to pass a national ban on the burqa in public spaces, as well as a law prohibiting the wearing of religious paraphernalia in state schools, like head coverings and crosses. American government and law, however, have reliably upheld the right of all persons to express their religious beliefs in public. This principle is a principle that Americans highly value. But for some, it can be a bitter pill to swallow. 
a native-born American from the 1850s would find an American political commencement presided over by Catholic priests, Jewish rabbis, female clerics, and a Mormon choir absurd. But this is precisely what Americans witnessed during the 2017 presidential inauguration. This is the new norm. Unless American democracy fails catastrophically, history suggests we can reasonably assume that Islam, like Catholicism, will soon receive broad recognition in America's political and public spaces. And isn't this what makes America great? Our commitment to equality and liberty for all people, whatever their creed? Catholics, Jews, Mormons, Muslims, and other marginalized groups have expanded the horizons of religious tolerance and all continue to demonstrate their vested interest in strengthening church-state separation in America. Thank you.